From coast to coast and around the world, it's time to praise the Lord. on Praise the Lord from the vacation capital of the world, exciting Central Florida, as we bring you anointed pastors, evangelists, teachers, authors, and other special guests with testimonies and teachings and music to glorify God as we lift up Jesus Christ as Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. I'm so glad you've joined me today. Today is going to be a very special broadcast. I have the honor of talking to you today about one of the greatest women preachers of all time, Catherine Kuhlman. I'm so honored that the TBN station here in Orlando has asked me to come and to do what I love doing is telling you about someone that God chose to do something extraordinary in a very powerful way to change a generation and impact the generations to come. Today, we're going to be talking about my most favorite preacher I've ever met in my entire life. I've been to 127 countries. I've been preaching for over 30 years. And I've had the honor of knowing most of the great Christian voices in my lifetime. But there was one that has stood out far beyond everybody else I ever saw. Her name was Catherine Kuhlman. She was a lady that I saw as a little boy. I didn't know her as an adult. I was a little boy, went to three of her services and met her and was the first person to talk to me and my family about my call. Catherine Kuhlman, to me, stands head and shoulders above anybody I've ever met. I will tell you today her life story. I will tell you the challenges that she went through and how she overcame and how God gave her a second chance, like he'll give you a second chance too. We serve a kind God. We serve a good God. We serve a God that is always working on trying to make good things happen for us. No matter how bad we've messed them up, he is thinking of a good thing to cause to happen in our life. Catherine Kuhlman's life story is not just a story of miracles. It's a woman who God gave a second chance to. Before I start in the life of Catherine Kuhlman, I want to just go back just a little bit in time and talk about two predecessors of hers that were great women preachers in the Pentecostal movement. Most of you know that I was born and raised in the Pentecostal church. Some of you have heard me speak before, and I love my Pentecostal roots. And if I happened to be a woman that was called to preach, I joined the Pentecostal people because the Pentecostal people, the charismatic people, have welcomed women into ministry without much reservations or much conflict. They've had some to overcome, but out of all the Christian groups and the different parts of the Christian family, the Pentecostals and Charismatics have said, let women obey God. Let women do what they're called to do. And we stood behind them, we supported them, and we cheered them. And even like today on this broadcast, we are going to honor them and say, thank God they obeyed. You that are watching today, you may feel the call of God in your heart. You may feel that God has spoken to you to be an evangelist or to a great missionary or to be a, a minister of healing like Catherine Kuhlman or some of the others we'll mention in just a moment. I want you to stop what you're doing. This is an appointment with God for you and your destiny. This is a moment where you're going to realize that no matter what you've gone through, it does not determine your output or your future. What happens is what you do with God from this point on. Everybody great has done something stupid. I know that's a harsh statement to say, especially to a Christian audience, because we almost live in a judgmental perfectionism. But let me say it again. Everybody great has done something that we can't believe they did. But they did it, and God gave them a recovery and a second chance, and God's people did too. I want to talk for a few moments before I get into the life of Ms. Kuhlman about two other women that came first in the Pentecostal movement, just for a few moments to honor them and to introduce you to them if you don't know them. The first one is a woman named Maria or Mariah Woodworth Etter. In the late 1800s, she was called of God and, uh, and traveled a lot in the Midwest part of the country. She'd married a Civil War veteran, and they tried to be farmers because most people in those days were farmers, and they just didn't do well. She'd have six children, and five of her babies would die. Her and her husband had gone through the sorrow of the death of their children. The farm didn't work. And finally, they came to a conclusion, why don't we obey God? 
Maria had felt the call of God as a young girl, but back then women didn't preach. That was a man's job, and this was in the late 1800s, and so they said, well, nothing else works, so let's go ahead and try that. And so Maria Woodward Edder began to go preach, and she pursued ordination among a group of people that didn't really like women preachers. But because she was a persistent woman, they ordained her and hoping that she would shut up and go away. So they said they will ordain her and send her to the place they had nicknamed the Devil's Den. The reason why the preachers had called this place the Devil's Den because every pastor they sent there to build a church had not won. The churches did not grow. They collapsed and disappeared. So they thought they would ordain her, send her to the Devil's Den, and Marie with her editor would just shut up and leave them alone. Well, they didn't know they were about to birth one of the great women preachers of the late 1800s and the grandmother of the Pentecostal movement. She went there and people were shocked that a woman had come to preach because back then women didn't preach and there was no movies and there was no cell phones and no computers in the late 1800s. So when they heard that a woman was preaching, they all came out to see the show because they couldn't believe it. So the crowd was bigger than normal. And she kept preaching for a few weeks and then a breakthrough happened. See, in those days, preachers stayed long enough for the breakthrough to happen. They didn't have a three-day seminar or a break or prayer meeting. They stayed until it actually happened. And when she got done there, she left the church of over 200 members. So the people that had ordained her had to repent, and I have to salute them and give them credit. They said they were wrong, got behind Maria, and they got to, to support her, and she became the number one church planner in that organization at that time. She was older in life at this time, she built a church in Indianapolis, Indiana, and a 28-year-old young lady preacher named Amy Sid McPherson wanted to go meet the grandmother of the Pentecostal movement. She wanted to go see Grandma Edder, Mother Edder, as they called her affectionately. She was now older, Mother Edder was, and her she was quite frail, and they called them the temple or the tabernacle years, and so Mother Edder preached all the days of her life, and when she was older, they'd put her in a chair like this, because I've seen the chair, and they would uh, put her in the chair to her house and walk her across the little, little alley from the house to the church and get her in the service, and she was old and her body was tired, but when they would start singing and start praising God, the anointing would fall, and she would become a young woman and get up and preach, and then when she got tired in her preaching, she'd go back and sit in the chair Somebody else would finish the service with the altar call or so forth, and they would take her back and put her to bed and wait for the next service. That's how Mother Edder finished her ministry life. Amy was on her way to see Mother Edder, and there had been a quarantine around Indianapolis because of an outbreak of, a, of smallpox that had begun to plague that area, and she was told, you can't get into Indianapolis. There's, there's a quarantine. And Amy said, when I get to the border, the quarantine will be lifted because this is an appointment with God. I must see Mother Edder. And when Amy drove to the border of Indianapolis, they had lifted the quarantine only an hour before, and she was able to go in and spend one evening with the great Mother Edder. Amy Simlick first would become what I would call the first lady of the Pentecostal movement. She was a controversial lady. She'd be married three times in her lives. I don't want you to go through that. But if you go through personal challenges, she's an example that God will give you a second chance, a third chance, and he'll, he'll keep working with you. But Amy's first husband was a Salvation Army preacher, and they got married, and they were Pentecostal or Spirit-filled, and they went off to China, and her husband died on the island of Macau off of China. She was pregnant with her first child, Sister McPherson was, and she didn't know what to do and didn't have enough money to get home when her mother in Canada had to raise the money to buy her the boat ticket for Amy and the granddaughter to come home to Canada. She thought her ministry was over. She herself had gotten sick and thought she was going to die, and she kept asking God, why won't you heal me? Why won't you touch me? And God kept saying to her, preach for me. And she kept saying, heal me. You know, you might want to listen to what God's saying and respond to him, and then everything else kind of gets in order. When you listen to what he's saying, that means that's important. And finally she said, well, I don't have a husband. He died, but if you want me to preach without a husband, I I I'll do it. And she records in her journal that God's power came and healed her of her disease. And she got up and started preaching. No one knew Amy McPherson those days. She wasn't famous. She was an unknown lady missionary that had a baby whose husband had died, and so... Sometimes she would go to a little place and had advertised her meetings and nobody was there for the lunch meeting, the lunch revival service. Well, that didn't bother Sister McPherson. When you watch she did, she says, it's lunchtime. Everybody's out buying lunch. So she'd go to the center of the little city where she was holding her meetings 
and she would do something like this. She would stand there and look up into the sky, and folks walking by would, uh, would look up in the sky, and they'd ask her, what are you looking at? And she wouldn't say a word. She just kept looking up in the sky. And pretty soon, people would gather around her because there's a woman in the middle of the city at the main cross fair staring in the sky. And Amy, on the out of peripheral vision, would see the crowd getting bigger. And when it got big enough that she liked, she'd run down the street into the auditorium or the tent and jump up on the platform and bang her tambourine and say, I'm looking for the king, are you? And that's how she started her American evangelism. And it began to grow, and the Pentecostals found that this woman here, people would love to hear her. And when she prayed for the sick, they got healed. So she became very popular in the young Pentecostal movement. But she'd marry a second time. And her husband, Mr. Mr. McPherson, was a nice Christian businessman. But it wasn't meant to be. It would end in divorce. I have a clip that I want to show you of Sister McPherson, and it's just her voice. She's telling this at her church at Angeles Temple in California. She's a founder of the Foursquare Gospel and the great preachers of all time. But before we get to Catherine, I had to honor Mother Edder, and I had to introduce you to Sister Amy. But I want you to take a moment and listen to Mrs. McPherson tell what she did when the divorce had happened, and now she had two kids, and you know, she's a single woman called to preach with two babies. What am I going to do? Here's what you may want to do as well. I took my suitcase and my babies, and I started off in the night, got a taxi cab, went to the depot, and started out to preach the Word of God. So I was invited to this town, that town, to preach the Word of God, preached outdoors under the trees, preached on the piazza, preached on the street corner. Wish you could see one of our street meetings, and we preached the Word of God. I preached from Canada, clear to Key West, Florida by winter and by summer, in tents or in open air or in buildings as the Lord opened up the ways and the word of God began to go forth. Crowds came and the multitudes gave their hearts to Jesus Christ and the sick were healed. And oh, I was happy. Bless the Lord. You just heard one of the most fantastic women preachers of modern times, Amy Sybil McPherson. She was known as the much merit evangelist. She was known as the controversial preacher of Los Angeles. She was the spiritual governor of L.A. would build a church called Angeles Till that have a tithe of the city in her church. 25,000 people. Amy McPherson would have a church that would seat, seat 5,400 people and fill it five times on a Sunday. The first six months of that church, there was over 8,000 people born again, 1,500 people baptized in water. And she preached 21 times a week and she did all the preaching herself. That's three services every day for six months, and she would have kept going, but your body can't handle that, so she began to get other people to help her and built the Great Revival Center and the seat of the governing power of the city of Los Angeles at that time. Amy would die in, in, in the 1940s, leaving the ministry to her son to run, and he did a great job in succession. But somewhere a few years after Amy's death, a red-headed woman named Catherine Kuhlman had been married for a few years had it moved from Colorado to California. She had lost everything. Her marriage was folding or collapsing. The church she had pastored in Denver, Colorado, had now begun to go under, and they removed her from the pastorate. The man that she'd married named Burroughs Waldtrip and her were coming to the end of what should never have been. Catherine Kuhlman tried to go to Amy McPherson's Bible school, only went for a few weeks and dropped out. Everything she did at that moment did not seem to work good for her. Catherine Kuhlman was about to have a life-changing experience at a dead-end street in Los Angeles. At the worst moment of her life, God gave her one of the greatest ministries of the modern times. Catherine Kuhlman said, I walked to a dead-end street in Los Angeles realizing I had nothing, I'd lost everything. Everything that I had built for God was gone. My name was ruined and gone, and now my marriage was ending. I walked to a dead-end street in Los Angeles, and I looked up to God and I said, I have nothing. I have nothing to give you, but that I love you with all my heart. If you can use that, 
please use me for your glory. At that moment, God placed on her a mantle of healing that he had tried to give to three people before her. She would later talk about that God had told her that she was his first, fourth person to give that mantle to. He'd asked three people before her, three men that said no. When I get to heaven, I want to interview these three guys that said no and say, what were you thinking when God was trying to give such a wonderful healing ministry and you said no? But at the worst moment of Catherine Kuhlman's life, God was looking for someone that was sincere, not perfect, sincere. You don't have to be perfect. You need to be honest and sincere with God from your heart. And at that moment, God said to Catherine, I have a ministry I need someone to do. Would you do it? She didn't know it would be a famous ministry. She didn't know it would be a huge healing ministry. She was just glad she got a second chance. Her marriage would end and she'd begin her journey that would take about 10 years of her life to get back to the place to where the divorce and all the talk and all the gossip and all the Christian hatred toward her would be overcome. I want to take a moment before I go any further. We have a clip of Miss Kuhlman talking from Anaheim, California at a great charismatic gathering. And before I tell you any more of her story, let's stop and let's listen to the woman who believed in miracles named Catherine Kuhlman. I'm not a seer, I'm not a prophet, a prophetess, but I believe the word of God. And I'd stake my very life on it. It's dark out there. The only restraining force that's left in the world today for good is the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only restraining power there is. I don't want to be here one five minutes after that the Holy Spirit has been taken out. I tell you, my brethren, I wouldn't want to be here one five minutes after the Holy Ghost has been taken out. He is the only restraining force in this world today. All the forces of hell are loose. And think what it's going to be like when the Holy Spirit is taken out. When Jesus Christ came to this earth in the form of flesh, he staked everything on this mighty third person of Trinity. I mean everything. Because he knew he would be as much man as though he were not God. He knew he would stand face to face with temptation. He knew the hour would come when he'd stand face to face with the evil one, the devil. And before he went away, the very last thing that he did, he made provision that you and I should not be defeated on a single score. If you're a part to this great body of believers, you do not have to go down in defeat for one split second. I do not have to go down in defeat for one split second. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus in this great auditorium. Greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Do you know that wonderful fellowship of the Holy Spirit? Do you really know what it means? Oh, I know there's that great ecstasy of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I know we're in a great charismatic world convention here today. You'll have great moments of ecstasy. And there'll never be a greater experience.
moments of emotion in your life than when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's marvelous. But my friend, do you know the experience of having yielded your will to the will of the Father? Not some of self and some of thee, but none of self and all of me. I feel that glorious anointing of the Holy Ghost, that provision that he has made for every one of his children. When he'll take the most ordinary, he doesn't ask for golden vessels. He doesn't ask for silver vessels. He asks for yielded vessels. Oh, and he'll take the most ordinary person. I don't care who that one might be. He'll give you a wisdom beyond the wisdom of man's understanding. give you a courage. He'll give you power. Where you feel you can stand alone. Arrayed against all the forces of hell. And you stand there strengthened. And you feel like a giant not to be called of your own strength, but because you're drawing on unseen resources. I haven't been speaking to you about something that's imaginary. I've been speaking to you about something that's the most real thing that can happen to any individual. I love listening to Catherine Kuhlman. Where did she come from? Where was she born? What was her family like? Let me take you down that part of her life now for a few moments. She wasn't born in a very rich family or a highly educated family or even a big city in America. She was born in the Show Me State, the state of Missouri, in a small little bitty town that she called a crossroad town called Concordia, Missouri. Her father, as you see there in the picture, that's Catherine Glenn with the big bow. Even when she was little, she seemed to have a way for drama or to stand out in the crowd. And that's her father, Joe Kuhlman. And they lived in this small little town, and her dad would become mayor of the town. Catherine Kuhlman would go around with their dad as he would do his business around town, and they got known as Joe Kuhlman and little Catherine, and they would walk around and do things together, and they lived there, and that's their home, home that they lived in, and that's Catherine there on the front porch. You see there Catherine just being a normal little girl. Her parents went to two different churches. One was Methodist and one was Baptist, and so the children had to kind of decide which one they wanted to go with that day, and they would go to the respectful churches. When Catherine Kuhlman was a teenager, 13 years old, she was in the back of the Methodist church. They were singing the benedictory song of that Sunday morning service, and something happened to Catherine Kuhlman. She didn't know what it was, and most people in the church that day when they left, they didn't know it either. All of a sudden, Miss Kuhlman reported, the Holy Spirit, the power of God came on her, and she began to cry and shake so much that she had to put down the hymnal or she was going to drop it. She didn't know what to do, so the only thing she knew to do was she walked from the back pew to the front of the church, and everybody in that little small Methodist church knew who she was. That was Joe Kuhlman's daughter. That's Catherine Kuhlman. That's just one of the girls in town. 
When they saw her crying, the ladies of the church all came around her and tried to comfort her, thinking that something had brought a disturbance to her soul. They didn't know that God had touched her. And somewhere between the nice words of the ladies of the church and Catherine Kuhlman's crime, she made contact with God and she was born again. She later said, I don't know if anybody in that church ever been born again before or after, but she goes, that day I met God. On her way home, she said, the sky looked bluer. The birds sing louder and everything was great. And she couldn't wait to get home to tell her papa that this wonderful thing had happened to her. She came through the front door of her home and walked into the living room. Her father was in his chair and she got in his lap and put her arms around him and tried to explain to him what had happened. And all he said was, that's nice, Catherine. He never understood that that was the day that his daughter found Jesus. Life goes on a little bit, and one of Catherine's sisters had married a healing tent preacher, and they were out on the evangelistic field with their tent and their children, and it was hard to take care of the kids and do all the things you do, and so they had called home to ask Catherine his parents, if they could send Catherine to help her be the nanny or to help take care of the kids and go with them on the evangelistic field. And Catherine received the answer that her parents approved and she left high school never to finish and joined her brother-in-law and sister. Their last name was the Parrots. And she was the nanny, in other words. And she was so happy to be out of Concordia and to be out there with the Lord's work. But then they didn't have enough money to keep her going, so they were going to close down the tent meeting and pastor and send Catherine home. But Catherine didn't want to go back to Concordia. She didn't want to go back to that small little boring town that she grew up in. She was becoming a bigger person and needed bigger life and bigger excitement. So she thought about it and she prayed and she made a decision as a teenager. If you'll go back to the picture you just showed, this was the time that Catherine Kuhlman decided that she is going to be a preacher. And you see there her with her suitcase and her Bible. And this was the day that Catherine Kuhlman started her public ministry. She was a teenage evangelist. Some of the greatest preachers of all were those who started as a child or a teenage preacher. So if your son and daughter that's a teenager wants to preach for God or be a missionary, don't push it aside. Encourage it. They may be the next great general in God's army that will help save many souls and bring healing to many sick people. So don't, don't be shocked and try to make them fit into your five-year life plan. Let them find God's plan and let something happen great to them. Catherine Kuhn began preaching as a teenager. and She didn't have churches or invitations. She preached in one-room schoolhouses. She'd go into turkey houses in Iowa and Montana and Idaho and clean them out and preach there during the night and sleep there during later in the night. And that's how she began her ministry. And she found her way to Denver, Colorado and started a great church. And the people in Colorado loved Catherine Kuhlman. There's a picture of her great church called the Denver Revival Tabernacle and the sign there on top of the building that says prayer changes things would blink red letters. Can you imagine being across the street if you were trying to sleep and there's a blinking sign? Prayer changes things and this church exploded and she was now becoming known around the nation as a great pastor. And when you were in Colorado, you got to go preach at the Kuhlman Church because it's a great church to go preach at. And so all the great preachers would go through there. Raymond T. Ritchie and all the other evangelists would go through there. And a man named Burroughs Waldtrip that had a radio chapel in Iowa, Mason City, Iowa, was where he was from, had gone there and preached, and he had invited her to come and help him in Mason City. And a long story short, Catherine Kuhlman and Burroughs kind of fell in love with each other, and they would get married against the advice of many of Catherine Kuhlman's friends and recognized ministers of the day had called or came by Colorado to tell Catherine, don't do it. Not that Burroughs was the wrong or an evil person, but it's just not the right person. A nice person doesn't always make it the right person. And Catherine Kuhlman and Burroughs would get married. During the wedding ceremony, Catherine Kuhlman would faint. I always wish she'd have come back going, no, but she came back saying yes. They got married and did all the things you do on your wedding day with your friends, with the presents and the dinner and the cake and all the, the, the things that you do. The story is, as they finished the afternoon and the evening came and the, the celebration of the wedding ended with all of her friends and his friends and family, they got in the car with a couple of the other part of the wedding party and drove back to the hotel to change 
their clothes. Catherine Kuhlman, as they pulled up into the parking lot of the hotel, jumped out of the car before her new husband could turn it off and her friends in the back seat could get out and ran to the room of a friend that had come to the wedding crying and walked inside of the room telling her friend, I made a mistake. Catherine Kuhlman knew within six hours of the I do that it should have been I don't. She would spend almost eight years of her life going downhill. She'd begin to preach and there was only a short moment when everybody celebrated them, but then her husband got a little jealous and wouldn't let her preach alone. He had, he had to go with her and they'd had to preach together. Then eventually, he wouldn't let her preach at all. She had to be the nice little wife that just sat in the chair next to him while he'd preach. And lo, and lower they went to where the meetings were canceled, the churches were lost, and they went to California to try to make things work. But that's where things turned. It was the darkest moment, and it turned. When she left that dead-end street that I told you about a few moments ago and started her 10-year journey back into the high call of her life, she had to overcome, not devils per se, I know they were there, but church people. Sometimes the meanest people you'll meet besides Lucifer are church people. I, I hope you're different. And if you're not, I hope you'll change right now and be kind. My, my parents and my mother and my grandmother always told me, treat people how you would like to be treated. That's probably how Jesus would treat them because you always will treat yourself right. Treat people kind. If you were in their situation, how would you like to be treated? Treat them like that. There would be people that would call the churches or send a telegram, that was before cell phones, and would tell the pastor, uh, do you know who's preaching for you? And he'd go, oh, Catherine Kuhlman, uh, she's divorced. And back in those days, when you were divorced, that was almost an unpardonable sin. The Pentecostal church has to grow even out of it today. But if there's a social cultural problem that is happening in society, we normally as Pentecostals prophesy against it, condemn it and damn it, and then about another decade, we find, find a strategy of love to help recover people from it. This was the days when divorce was beginning to hit society and it hit the marriage of Burroughs and Catherine. And now the, the little, what would you say, the taint, the stigma of divorce was now trying to push her down. The worst night of her life in those years, she was speaking to over 3,000 people and the pastor that had invited her and was happy the crowd was so great and the people were so happy, received word that his evangelist was a divorcee. And he walked to the platform while she was preaching and took the mic away from her and told her to leave town and had her ushers, his ushers, take her to the hotel room and watched her pack her bag and put her on the Greyhound bus and told her to leave town and never come back. And she heard as she was escorted off the stage, the band that invited her saying, I apologize for bringing a false prophetess to town. I'll never do it again. These were some of the struggles that Catherine Kuhlman would go through. But she went to a little town on the border of Ohio and Pennsylvania to hold a meeting. There was no pastor in this church. They were elders that were taking care of the church, hoping to find a pastor, but they'd saw Miss Kuhlman and wanted her to come, and she agreed to come, and they'd had a great salvation meeting, and, and they were going to meet for her for breakfast the next day before she'd leave town. And that night, as the last night of the meeting ended, the elders and their wives got together and had a little prayer meeting, and God told them something. They said, you found your pastor tonight, and it's Catherine Kuhlman. So breakfast, they came extra perky and excited, and uh, they, they said, hello, good morning, Miss Kuhlman. And she said, well, good morning. She goes, we've got some good news to tell you. We found our pastor. She goes, I'm happy for you. And they go, it's you. You are a pastor. And she goes, no, 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 I can't be your pastor. And they would go back and forth going, yes and no, yes and no. And finally, Catherine would tell them, you don't want me to be your pastor. They said, why? She says, I'm divorced. They took a moment to process what the Lord had said and what Catherine just told them, and I hope you'll act like this. 
he came back to her in a few moments and said, we don't know about the Catherine that's divorced. We know this Catherine, and this Catherine we like, we love, and this Catherine, God said, is our pastor, so you're it. And that was the day, the ending of all the pain of the struggle and the accusation and the gossip that she had endured because of the divorce in her life begin to heal for the final time. It was during this season of her life that she began a series of teachings on the person of the Holy Spirit. It was at that moment the healing mantle that hit her in Los Angeles finally showed up in the earth. While she was speaking, people began to get healed just sitting in their chairs. And all of a sudden, miracles begin to happen. No one touched them. There was no high emotion. And sometimes you wonder if they're healed or someone just saying yes to get the guy from, quit pushing them while he's praying for them. That wasn't Catherine. She had a finesse about her. She had a presence. She had a class and a grace about her that God came through and healed the most unlikely person sitting there. She said, I want him to touch you first because I don't have any healing power. I have no healing virtue. If he doesn't touch you, nothing's going to happen. I have found in my research a little clip from Canada. This little clip that I want to show you next is a news conference of Canadians in Toronto asking Miss Kuhlman questions about her ministry that was going to happen there the next day. What you're going to see is a couple of questions from reporters and her response, and you'll go to a few moments in a live miracle service in Toronto, Canada. And when you come back, I'm going to tell you about the miracles and when I say Catherine Kuhlman, why you think the way you do. And one thing get very clear, and that is that Catherine Kuhlman has nothing to do with these miracles. Please get that straight and call me anything. I don't care what you call me, but don't call me a faith healer, whatever you do. I, because I resent that very much because I am not a faith healer. And always, you know, I'm referred to as a faith healer. I've never healed anyone. I have no healing power. I have no healing virtue. And um, it's so simple that that's the reason that people miss it. It's still God. They forget that the greatest force in the world and the greatest power in the world is God. I'm not a psychic healer. Don't put me in the category of, of a psychic healer. These healings are not a matter of mind over matter. It's simply the power of God. It's that simple. If you could only get people to understand it. Somebody else have a question? <laughs> You see how simple it is? I like that she's so pure and so honest. I have no power. I have no healing power. It's God, and it's that simple. That was one of her great statements. She'd always say, it's so simple. Most people miss it. Now, what I want to do next is I want to go straight into a Las Vegas miracle service where a little crippled boy got healed while he was sitting out with his family in the auditorium. And I want you to see the miracle. And then you'll understand why thousands of people flocked to see her, the woman that believed in miracles. Doctor, what is this? This little 11 year old boy had rheumatoid arthritis aff affecting his hips and his knees and his uh, ankles, and wrists. And this is his wheelchair. You mean this is the little boy's wheelchair? Yes. Honey, is this? This is the most beautiful child. I would have come to Las Vegas just for the healing of this youngster. How old are you, honey? Eleven. Tell the people how old you are. Eleven. What's your name? Yeah. I want you to see this little wheelchair. Look. This little wheelchair for, made for a little 11-year-old boy, rheumatoid arthritis. This is grandmother, the grandmother who brought him, remember. 
Walk across the stage, honey. Walk across there. If you want to see a beautiful face, if you want to see a beautiful, look at the smile on this face. Here's his wheelchair. How many feel like it's all worthwhile? Put up a hand. Look at his wheelchair. Look at the smile on this face. You can't doubt the smile. You can't doubt the smile. And Grandma brought him. Where do you live? Here in Vegas. Where, where, where do you people go to church? Uh, first Baptist. First Baptist Church. Pick him up real high. Walk again. Pick him up real high. Steal higher. Steal higher. Look, 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 look. All you have to do is to exercise him. That's all on earth that you have. Look, look at that face. Does nothing hurt? Doesn't it hurt? No, no. You mean it doesn't hurt? Okay, take your wheelchair. You push it, honey. Go on. There he goes. There he goes. Don't thank me. I didn't do a thing. There he goes. Give him a great big God bless. And we vow to give you the praise. We vow to give you the glory. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit. Go down the aisle, honey, I wonder. Go down this main aisle. Turn around, turn around. Push your old wheelchair, honey. This is holy ground. Oh, God love it. I wanna see you riding your bike tomorrow. I was in a Catherine Kuhlman service myself, and I saw things like this that I'd never saw before. It was not high emotion. He didn't walk away thinking, was that real or was that just a lot of hype? And when you were in Catherine Kuhlman Miracle Service, you got mad when it was over. As a little boy, I went to the Oral Roberts Maybe Center and Catherine Kuhlman was there. And I saw people get out of wheelchairs like you saw here. People get out of chairs and just walk like it had been normal. But the thing that stands out to me the most was not what I saw, but it's what I felt. And I still miss the feeling more than what I saw. For three, four hours in a Catherine Kuma meeting, they weren't done in an hour, the song, the message, and the benediction like we are today. It was three, four, sometimes five hours. And you got mad when it was over and you couldn't believe it was over. When God comes into a room, the first thing that disappears after the devils is the clock. Time ceases and things change. And I remember sitting in a Catherine Kuhlman meeting and I felt the presence of God on me for hours and, and my flesh, my little body shook, not violently or scary, to just enough that I can still remember it. And I'm thinking, in all the meetings that I have, if I could just have a little bit of that in my own service of what Miss Kuhlman had in a huge way, I'd be happy. Catherine Kuhlman was like a little girl like you saw Every miracle was like the first one. And you'd hear sometimes people say, thank you, thinking that she did the healing. And she'd go, oh, don't thank me. I had nothing to do with it. God did it all. So many times people have to be pointed to the source. Sometimes our miracle ministries today like the applause and they take it for themselves and that's why they're short-lived or the quality of the miracles begin to fade or disappear. One of the great secrets of Catherine Kuhlman's life was she gave all the glory to God for what happened because, as she would say, I know better than anybody else. I have nothing to do with this whatsoever. It's all the Holy Spirit. The pictures you're seeing are normal crowds. They don't have the pictures, I mean, they'll have one to show you, of the folks on the outside trying to get in. There you go, there's the picture. The fire marshal has shut the doors and those are the folks who can't get in. This woman was not highly educated. She didn't come from the right family. She came from a small town that you have to work to get to. But she gave her heart to God. And when God gave her a second chance, she kept that as the most sacred thing beyond her salvation in her life. 
I want to take a moment and let her talk to you. From the campus of Oral Roberts University, she's talking to the student body about what it was when she met the Holy Spirit the first time. And then we'll go into a second clip of where she talks about what it cost her to have this great ministry. Open your heart and let something happen to you now. I can only give you my own personal experience. No one can give to anyone else any more than they've experienced themselves. Always remember that. And just in a very simple way, I'll give you my own personal experience regarding the Holy Spirit. My first, my very first association with the Holy Spirit was in a little Methodist church in Concordia, Missouri. If only you could know from whence I've come. Concordia, I don't think, is on the map. It's so small. Not more than 1,200 population. Mama was Methodist. Papa was Baptist. Neither one worked too hard at it. <laughs> and one Sunday morning, and it says, real to me, this was my very first contact with the Holy Spirit. And I didn't realize it. One Sunday morning, sitting with Mama in that little Methodist church, I don't think the church holds any more than a hundred people. We were sitting there. It was time for the last song, and I was holding the old-fashioned Methodist hymnal. Whether anyone has ever been converted in that church before or since, I'll never know. But when the last song was being sung and I was holding that old-fashioned Methodist hymnal in my hand, I was only 14 years of age. Something happened to me. I cannot tell you one word the preacher said and not one. But I only know that in that moment, the Holy Spirit came upon me. I did not recognize, I did not even know there was such a thing as the Holy Spirit. And I began to shake. I began to tremble. So much so I had to lay the hymnal down in the pew. And I knew I had to do something. I saw myself as I really was a sinner in the sight of God. And I did something. I laid that hymnal down and I did the only thing that I knew what to do. I'd seen them take in church members. And I stepped forward and sat down in the first pew right in the corner and wept. This was my conversion. This was my first contact with the Holy Spirit. I began to weep, and I remember one of the old sisters came to me and brought me a handkerchief. She said, oh, Catherine, she says, don't cry. You and I both know that you've been such a good little girl. We both knew she was lying. <laughs> but in that moment, something happened to me. That was the new birth experience, and it was so real that I've never doubted it since. Never. I believe that when you're really born again, there's a definite place, there's a definite time, and you know it. And His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will bear witness with your spirit that you pass from death unto life, and it's been that spiritual experience. It's been my new birth experience that's been so real, but in that moment, I had my first contact with the Holy Ghost much, but it's worth the cost. It costs everything. If you really want to know the price, if you really want to know the price, I'll tell you. 
cost you everything. Catherine Kuhlman died a long time ago. I know the day, I know the hour, I can go to the spot where Catherine Kuhlman died. I had nothing. I know better than anyone else from whence I've come. From a little crossroads town in Missouri with a population of 1,200 people. I had nothing. I was born without talent. Most people are born with something. I didn't even have hair on my head when I was born, just red fuzz. One day, I just looked up and said, wonderful Jesus, I have nothing. I have nothing to give you but my love. That's all that I can give you. And I love you with all my heart. And I give you my body as a living sacrifice. You can take nothing and use it. Then here's nothing. Take it. It isn't silver vessels that he's asking for. It isn't golden vessels that he needs. He just needs you. You had a little taste of what thousands would hear in her lifetime. Catherine Kuhlman was not a great aura to preacher like an Or Roberts or a Billy Graham. She was a handmaiden of the Lord, as she would call herself, that had a distinct call to ministry. As you heard there in that clip, she knew the day and the hour that she was born again, and she would also would say, I know the very moment that God gave me my call to ministry, the day that Catherine Kuhlman died. Can you imagine being one of the 10,000 or 8,000 in an auditorium and the lady was on stage in a white dress, floating like she was, talking about, I die a thousand deaths. And if you didn't know what she was talking about, you were trying to figure out, how'd she die? I interviewed people that would go to her meetings, and they would cry and didn't know why. And they'd hear her talk about, don't grieve my friend, the Holy Spirit, if he leaves, nothing. She goes, and we were so scared, we sat frozen in our chairs because we didn't want to hurt her friend, whoever he was. People came from all over America by the thousands to see her. Here's what a Catherine Kuhlman miracle service was like. The rule became when the auditorium is full and the fire marshal has locked the doors or has communicated that there can be no more people in the building, she'd have one of her people call her at the hotel and tell her, Catherine, the building's full. And she'd respond, I'll be there soon. Why should people wait three or four hours for the time for it to start when the building's already full of capacity? So she'd go over and tell them, start the music. Let the choir begin to sing. Sometimes 500 voice choir would be her crusades. She'd come through the back of the auditorium and meet the people in her VIP lounge and greet them and thank them for coming and then ask them to take their seats. She'd put on her white dress, which was her official uh, gown or dress that she wore when she preached and ministered. And there was a rule that she would say goodbye to everybody or greet them, and right before she'd go on the platform, nobody could talk to her. There was a rule. And she would pace back and forth behind the curtain or behind a door 
of the auditoriums and the places she'd preach where Catherine Kuhlman would die again, she'd say. I'd die a thousand deaths. Well, what she meant was that she'd tried to empty of all of Catherine's ambition, her pride, and to make herself the most yielded person she could. And when she felt like she had got to the place where she has yielded her everything, she would turn and walk from behind the curtain or open the door and come out on the stage. And I remember that moment when I was a little boy. When she walked out on that stage, it wasn't just the emotion of her entrance into the auditorium, but there came across that auditorium a wave of anointing that didn't go up and down like that. It began to grow and it kept increasing the whole time we were there. She had a small crusade team, a pianist that was a part of her team for many years, and she had a soloist named Jimmy McDonald. And I want to stop right now and take you to Jimmy McDonald singing in a Catherine Kuhlman miracle service. And after that, she began to preach. But here's Jimmy in the Crusades. I sing because I'm free singing. I sing because I'm so happy. And I sing because I'm free. I'm free. His eyes must Just know he watches me. Why should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be And just long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion and he's all I need, <laughs> my constant friend is he, he's right there, his eyes. Just know he watches me. Now I sing because I'm so happy. And I sing. I know it may not be the musical style that your church has or what you may prefer, but sometimes it's good to have some of the great hymns be sung properly in a way where the words and the message and the anointing rips your soul in a way that opens you up for a touch from God. Catherine Kuhlman's Miracle Services was not trying to be the most inventive in the latest uh, theatrics with smoke machines or crystal balls or all those little, not crystal balls, but disco balls and all those things. Her stage that you saw was very simple. A piano and an organ, a simple little microphone, and a big stage. And she stood there and she didn't preach very deep theological sermons. They were very simple. She usually called them a little heart-to-heart -heart talks she'd have with the people. And somewhere in the middle of her little talk about 
her friend, the Holy Spirit. Then the two gifts that were the most powerful in her life was the word of knowledge and the working of miracles. And I should say the third one would be the gifts of healing. And while you were sitting in the auditorium, she had a, Norval Hayes told me that she had such a powerful word of knowledge, she could look into a dark part of the auditorium in the balcony area we could hardly see and say, there's a person sitting up there behind the pole who's wearing this, this kind of dress and you're being healed right now. When she would do that, many of her workers that would be around the auditorium would run up in that area and look for that person to help encourage that person to respond and begin to work with the healing power of God because they knew when Miss Kuhlman called that word of knowledge out, it was a fact. It wasn't a fake. It wasn't a phony. It was there. And one of the most beautiful things about a Catherine Kuhlman meeting, the doubters got healed. The skeptics got touched. The scoffers that thought she was a witch or thought that she was way out there and strange that came just out of intrigue while they were sitting there the power of God would come over them and heal them. Miss Kuhlman, like many of the great healing preachers, believed in this statement, that healing was the dinner bell to salvation. Healing was not the ultimate manifestation of God's love and God's power, but it was a sign of God's heart toward man that would lead them to the greatest healing of all, and that was when a person is healed from the disease called sin. That when you accept Christ as your Savior, then that sin nature and the, all the effects of sin would begin to be washed away. She believed, like I do and like many of you, that miracles is the dinner bell to salvation or the calling card to come to Jesus and have eternal life that's only found in Christ Jesus. Her services would go three and four hours. And many times people came there from all different backgrounds, Sometimes the pastors had said, don't go to the service of Catherine Kuhlman. She's a witch. But you know, when you tell your church people don't do something, they're going to do it. And a lot of them would go to her services and come back and the pastor would have to repent because the sick person now was healed and they couldn't deny the fact. It's like in the Bible, this man stands before us whole and the people know that it's God. Many of her skeptics became Christians and are still Christians today. Ms. Coleman's office was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Let me tell you a few things that you might find intriguing, a little bit of fun. She used to go to the Pittsburgh airport to fly to her meetings and to her TV taping that she would do in Los Angeles, California, because she had a TV show called I Believe in Miracles with Catherine Kuhlman. It was the longest running TV show or religious TV show that CBS has ever had in their history was the Catherine Kuhlman show. Back then, TV networks were only three, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And if you were on one of them, you were able to get a large part of the American audience. So every Sunday morning, I do remember as a child watching Or Roberts and Rex Humbard and Catherine Kuhlman, and she'd come on the air with her nice little organ music, and she'd say the same thing. She'd say, I believe in miracles because I believe in God. So when she started her show, and she talked kind of funny and was a little theatrical and people thought she was putting on a show, but I interviewed some of her friends in Concordia and, and Catherine was always dramatic. They said even from a little girl. So that wasn't something she was putting on. That was Catherine Kuhlman's personality. Like you have yours, she had hers. And the reason why she talked the way she did, to be very honest with you, when she was a little child, she had a small speech impediment and her mother made her overpronunciate every word to help correct that speech impediment. So as a little girl, when she would start to talk fast or excited and slur her words or start stuttering, her mother would say, slow down and say each letter and each word precisely. And that's why Catherine Kuhlman said the Holy Spirit. Well, her the way she talked, worked for the whole thing, worked for a TV show, worked for the audience. Thank God her mama taught her how to talk properly. She might have made her overpronounce everything, but it worked. But back to the Pittsburgh airport. Like you and I, when we go to catch a plane, we check in and do all the things that we do. And 
But there kept being a problem at the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania airport. The problem was every few weeks in the month, there'd be a problem because there would be people that'd be on the floor up against the wall and the medics would be called and they thought they were having a heart attacks or dying or something and they couldn't figure out why this kept happening in the Pittsburgh airport. And finally, they figured out that coincidence and the woman that believed in miracles all happened about the same time. So they followed her and watched her. And sometimes as she'd be walking down the hallway of the airport, people just fall up against the wall or fall down. And they finally came to her and said, Miss Kuhlman, you can't keep doing this in the airport. She said, well, I didn't do nothing. I, it just happens. They said, let's, 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 let's do this. When you come to the airport, call us and We'll bring you like a VIP into the airport and we'll escort you through the back ways and put you in the plane so you can't keep disturbing the peace at the airport. That's how Miss Kuhlman had to go to the airport until she had a list on her desk or in her office of all the wealthy businesses in America that would have the honor of flying Catherine Kuhlman on their private jets to her appointments and her crusades. She didn't own a jet. All the folks that owned the jet was thrilled to be able to fly Catherine Kuhlman from Pittsburgh to wherever she was going and back home. Isn't that wonderful that the people that had the planes had to be on a list for their turn to fly Catherine to her appointments? Another thing I want to share with you before we have another little clip, I could talk about Catherine Kuhlman all day long. I'm only giving you little bits. But it wasn't just preachers inviting Catherine Kuhlman to hold a miracle crusade in their town. Toward the end of her life, the mayors of American cities were writing Catherine Kuhlman and inviting her to their city. Like Las Vegas, Monroe, Louisiana, other places where the mayor said, we'll give you the auditorium. We'll do whatever we can. Would you come to our town? I can't wait for that day to return that when the mayors of American cities and Canadian cities are requesting the woman of God, the man of God, the people of God to come to their town and bring God's message of salvation and healing and compassion. I don't think I've ever received an invitation from a government official yet, but I'm waiting. But in her life, that was a common happening toward the end of her life. Before I go any further, I want to stop just for a moment and show you another clip. This was of a secular TV show that was aired in America that talked about the supernatural. This was filmed and, uh, and put together right after she died. She had done the interview and then she had passed away before they could air it. So you'll see how the secular media talked about Catherine Kuhlman. I hope you'll enjoy it. I stood there amazed in 1948 when the woman told me that she'd been healed of a tumor in Franklin, Pennsylvania. I was awed. All when this Mr. Orr came and said that he'd received sight in an eye. Because I'd never touched him, I'd never prayed for him. I too was curious as to what had happened. Recently, the St. Louis Globe Democrat reported that since 1948, and this is the figure that they gave, that at least two million people had been healed by the power of God through this ministry. At one time I thought this was a, uh, this was a, uh, well it was phony, but when it happened to me, I'd just tell the whole world that this is the, the, the truest thing that ever was. And I've seen healings here then make your hair stand on that. Hi, my name is Carol, and I had a healing last month. I had ankylosing spondylitis, which is arthritis of the small joints of the spine, and it had been verified by x-rays that uh, calcification had set in, and the doctors had confirmed it as being incurable and that it would get progressively worse. I had a healing, and my spine is straight, and I'm fine, and praise the Lord, I'm better than I have ever been, and I'll never be the same again. Two million 
people. This is what the news media has given. That's the reason, you know, the ministry needs no defense. <laughs> These miracles of healing need no defense. Sitting there, there are thousands who are watching. And they may, may feel as though that I am over dramatic when someone is wonderfully healed by the power of God. What they don't understand is that I'm just as thrilled with the very last miracle that I saw God perform as the first time. There are no words in the human vocabulary to describe spiritual experiences and emotions because these things are spiritual, but as real as the air that you breathe. I thought they needed more air conditioning. I was getting so terribly hot, and then all at once, when I turned to look at Bernie, my head turned without holding it up. Now I can feel my hands and everything, and I noticed as soon as I stood up, I could feel my feet. With multiple sclerosis, you don't have any feeling. I was a 245-pound vegetable, all humped over, stiff neck, left side paralyzed. As I walked in this auditorium, God performed a miracle. He straightened my body completely up. I had no ill feeling. My hands straightened up. I could turn my neck. My left side had use in it. I was a new man. I know from my own experience in my 30 years of surgery and working with patients of this kind that this is medically impossible, that this has to be a miracle of God to give me this healing of my back and to relieve this constant pain that I had in my leg. How do you feel now? I feel vibrant. vibrant? I feel like I could sh shock the world. By doing what? Praise the Lord. <laughs> I was blind and was led around like blind people. Have you seen a doctor about condition? Oh, yes, for years. And, and what happened this afternoon? I don't know. I started to cry. And um, I didn't ever cry much because I think that's one of the things about glaucoma. You don't have much fluid in the eyes or something. And then I thought I saw the stage, but I didn't believe it. I thought it was in my mind's eye that I saw it. And I took my glasses off and rubbed my eyes. And I said to Quan, I see a little boy in a green sweater. I was stunned. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't say anything. I, I, I kept wanting to cry, but I couldn't. It, it was just that I was walking around dazed. I couldn't believe I was really seeing it. Even though I believe in the supernatural power of God, I'm not personally immune to sickness. I too can become ill. Catherine Kuhlman died following open heart surgery. It's likely, however, that her legacy of love and healing will be an inspiration for generations to come. The lady from the little town of Concordia, Missouri, made too strong an imprint on too many millions of people to be soon forgotten. Catherine Kuhlman. I believe in miracles because I believe in God. The reason why, 40 years after her death and the decades to come, the people would admire Catherine Kuhlman, we trust her in several ways. We trust her, number one, that she'll follow the Holy Spirit according to chapter and verse. We trust her that she was a person that we can follow as she followed the Lord. She made sure that she gave all the glory to God and took none for herself. Catherine Kuhlman died, and that meant her ego to want to be seen. That's why, as you saw in the little clip that we showed, the purity and the beauty and the simplicity that it's the power of God. I have no healing virtue. Some of the quotes that I like of Catherine Kuhlman that I want to give to you today, I remember hearing her say, you ask me? what this ministry cost. All you ever see is the white dress and the empty wheelchairs. Do you know what I see at the end of every miracle service? I see the one person in the wheelchair that was not healed and I ask why. And I wonder if I could have done something different that could have helped that one be healed. You ask me what it cost to have a ministry like this? 
It cost you everything. And every time she would say that, she normally would say this after, and it's worth the cost. So many of us are wanting to be famous and not a servant. We want to be the star and not the servant to the great I am. Catherine Kuhlman would live her life in ministry to where people from all walks of life were affected. When she would go out to California to do her taping of her TV show, in those days, the great secular stars were Sonny and Cher. They had their great TV show. And the only person that Cher would allow to use her dressing room, because she was the top star at the time for that network, was Catherine Kuhlman. No other star could come into her dressing room or use it to change and do those things. She only allowed Catherine Kuhlman to use her dressing room. It's reported that she was asked one time, why do you allow that strange woman preacher to use your dressing room? She says, because I like how I feel after she's been there. The presence of God was something that Catherine did not just have for a show of a miracle crusade. She had it as a part of her everyday life like you can. Miss Kuhlman was not something special in the way that what she had with God you cannot have. That relationship with God you can have if you will spend time and pursue it. James 4, 8 says, if you draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. That's up to you. The door is open. The veil's been ripped. You can come in if you want to. The thing with Catherine, she went in and she stayed where you and I visit once a month. She stayed there more than all of us put together. That's the difference between you and I and her. Miss Kuhlman had friends in ministry, but she'd also would say, I'm the loneliest person in the world. A lot of the great preachers, surrounded by thousands, had a problem with loneliness. It wasn't just they didn't have friends, people that didn't understand them, put them in a little world of their own or on a pedestal that they didn't want to be on, but you can't control the public's view. You can only control how you respond to the public's attitude about you. But she found a good friend in a man named Or Roberts. Or Roberts became her friend. They were the top healing evangelist at this time. I asked Or Roberts, how did Catherine Kuhlman die? In 1976, in February, it's when Miss Kuhlman would graduate to heaven. Her last service would be at the Shrine Auditorium in California. And she was very sick with a heart problem to the point that you could see her heart beat under her white dress. And one of my friends was to be the solo of special music in that last crusade. He said, I knew the rules. I wasn't was supposed to talk to Catherine Kuhlman. Instead of Miss Kuhlman pacing and preparing herself to go out onto the stage to minister, she was holding on to the curtain this time, and I didn't know if I should go up and help hold her up or to leave her alone because I knew the rule, but I saw her, and she looked like she was about to fall. So he said, I closed my eyes not knowing what to do. As I walked closer, I heard her say, Lord, give me that anointing one last time. Let me have that anointing one more time. He said, I took a step back knowing I was in that sacred place that she'd be before every service. I closed my eyes. He said, when I opened them, she was gone. She was on the middle of the stage, like there was no physical problem whatsoever, greeting the crowd and went out there and preached and healed the sick and gave an altar call. And three hours later, she walked behind the curtain and fell on the ground, never to preach again. They flew her to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where at that time was the best heart surgeon in America, was doing his practice. That was also the home of Oral Roberts University, where Oral Roberts lived. And he was called one day to go pray for Catherine Kuhlman. She was sick. Everybody knew that she was sick. She was in her late 60s. And I asked Oral Roberts when I was visiting one time, can you tell me what happened the day you went to pray for Catherine Kuhlman toward the end of her life? Here's what he said. He said, I was called and I went to the hospital, St. John's Hospital in Tulsa. I walked in with my wife, Evelyn, to reach out to pray for her. 
And he said, all of a sudden, my wife grabbed my arm and I opened my eyes and said to Evelyn, what? And she goes, Oral, I think she's trying to tell us something because she couldn't talk. She was so sick and had had the surgery and some things. And she, she was physically exhausted. And she put up that long finger and did that. And she, Evelyn said to Oral, I said, I think she wants to go to heaven. And Oral said, I leant, knelt down close to her and said, Catherine, do you want to be healed or do you want to go to heaven? And she put up her finger and did that. He said, well, then let's pray that you go. Let's pray that you have run your course and lay your body down and go to your heavenly reward and let's get, let's get you to heaven. And he prayed a simple prayer for God to take his servant. She was done. She was tired. Within a few weeks, the great woman named Catherine Kuhlman had graduated to heaven. My favorite quote of Catherine Kuhlman, of all the books and the thousands of hours of listening to her radio shows, is the one that I'm about to give you. Our newspaper reporter asked her toward the end of her life, had she ever seen Jesus or had a vision of the other side? She said, I've never seen Jesus. I've never seen an angel. I've never seen anything. You think a woman like Catherine Kuhlman would see something. People today have five visions in one day, they say. But here's a woman that had a great miracle ministry. She said, I never saw anything. She said to the reporter, but I know what I'm going to say to him when I see him the first time. And I'm so glad the reporter did a follow-up question. What are you going to tell him? And if you know her voice and know her gestures, you can hear her. When I finally get to see Jesus for the very first time face to face, I know exactly what I'm going to say. I'll get to look in his wonderful face and say, Dear Jesus, I tried. I did the best that I knew how. I want you to see an altar call of Catherine Kuhlman, and then I'm going to come back and pray for you. This is the greatest miracle of them all. That beautiful spiritual experience more than anything is in the whole world. More than anything in the whole world, and here they come. I love that new birth experience. I want to be a part of the body of Christ. Born into his church, and here they come. I want to know that the mighty creator is my heavenly father. Here they come, come on. And they come from the balconies, they come from the bleachers. And they're coming from way up there, come on. Some of you have never had that beautiful new birth experience. And the word said, ye must be born again. Ye must be born again. And him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. And they come and still they come. Stand there with your eyes closed and your heads uplifted. Unashamedly, but audibly, say, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. come into my heart. Come into my heart. Forgive my sins. Forgive my sins. Take me just as I am. Take me just as I am. I give myself to you. The greatest miracle of all miracles is that when a person is healed from the disease called sin. In Catherine Kuhlman's life, the miracles were wonderful, but for her, what you just saw was the greatest happening of every crusade and every meeting. When the people would run to the front, like you saw there, by the hundreds and sometimes by a couple thousand, Sometimes she would stand there and hardly even give an altar call like she did. And they'd just start running forward, wanting what they saw in Catherine Kuhlman's life. 
You too can be saved. You too can know Christ like she knew Christ. He wants to save you. He wants to know you. He wants to help you. You can pray the same prayer she prayed wherever you are, today, tomorrow, and just ask Christ to come into your life. Ask Jesus to come in and help you, that you want him, you accept him, you desire him. And when he hears your voice and he hears your request, he'll respond. He won't reject you no matter what you've done or how people have treated you and told you things that may not be the truth. Jesus accepts you. He'll forgive you and give you a brand new beginning. All you have to do is request it and he'll come. For you that are also watching, you feel called of God and you might have made mistakes. Every great person's made mistakes. Every great person has had to overcome public opinion, lies, gossips, and their mistakes but God will give you a second chance. He'll give you another day to be used by his mighty power. He'll forgive you and give you a new start. So wherever you are sitting here today, wherever you may be, no matter what you face, no matter what's been said to you, hear me now, God will give you and your ministry a new day. It doesn't matter how bad it was or what happened, God will give you a new day. And I pray for you now that God will revive your soul and stir your gift and give you a new spirit of faith to turn things around that you may be able to reach the people of this generation that you're responsible for, whether it's in America or another land someplace far. God will respond to you if you just reach out in the most simplest way and say, help me, I'm willing to run again if I know your hand and my hand are together. And I pray for you also that God will remove the wrong people out of your life and put the right people in your private life and in your public life. I pray for you that God will deliver you from the negatives, from the anti, and for God to lift you up and make you a brand new voice in this generation. I pray that for you in Jesus' most mighty name. I'm glad we spent this hour and a half together. I hope it has meant something to you. I hope that you'll get all of Catherine Kuhlman's books and her tapes and things. I've written some books on her. I hope you'll get those so you can learn more about her. I can't tell you everything and sometimes just hearing you, hearing her for yourself is far better than me ever talking about her. I'm so glad that I had the time to meet her and to be in her services, to feel that anointing that was so thick and heavy. And sometimes you could hear the sound of God's presence like a roar that was there in the room. I remember at the Maybe Center, a nun getting out of a wheelchair and walking for the very first time, her arms all crippled up and moved her hands and each finger one at a time came forward and began to move. The miracles that God did then he can do today. He's looking for yielded vessels. He's looking for those people who are not trying to be something special or something great or something mighty. He's trying to find someone who'll just be simply available to do the plan and the purpose of God. Not everybody has the same responsible role in the body of Christ, but everybody's role is significant for the end time fulfillment of God's plan and purpose. We don't need to be afraid of public opinion. We don't need to be afraid of public opinion. We need to do what God's told us to do. Be strong about it and give him all the glory. May God give you a wonderful and blessed evening. God bless you.
This program has been brought to you through the prayers and contributions of our faithful partners throughout North America and the world.